Dr. Hun. Um, Welcome to my podcast. It's called Coffee and Conversation. And I'm here today with Aish, who is a content contributor on our platform. And today we want to talk a little bit about you and who you are and what you came here to bring us. So would you like to introduce a little bit about yourself to everybody that's listening? Well, uh, my name is, maybe I should introduce a little bit of my name. And uh, if this is for the Singaporean uh, listeners, then my name is Hoon Sing Kiao. And a little bit of my background, uh, I have, um, I'm a Singaporean and, I, and I've lived in Sweden for 40 years. So before that, uh, I was, I attended a Chinese school and after my pre-university, I went to Sweden to study. Uh, the reason I chose Sweden was because of its free education. The, the country um, offered you know, free educations to foreign students. So I was from a poor family. I understood that the money that my mom was saving, my mom was a single mother. Uh, the, the saving she has made was well, mainly for my elder brother's education. So that left me no choice. So I took, you know, uh, when I heard that Sweden was the only country that could offer free education, I wrote to them, of course, with all my uh, certificates from the schools and I got accepted and I went. So I went there without any friends nor relatives. I could not speak a single word in Swedish. We don't speak English. It's all the, the whole society speaks Swedish. Uh, so that was a little bit of my background. And uh, when I went there, so the first thing I had to do was to attend a Swedish language course organized by the university. And so to earn my living, even though the education itself, actually the tuition fee is free of charge, uh, but I still need to survive. You know, I, need, I still need money to buy books, uh, buy, you know, to, to, to pay my food, rent, all that kind of thing. So I worked as a part-time cleaner for families. Later on, I got a job at a mental hospital <laughs> in Sweden and gradually I advanced to old folks home. <laughs> That was my life, but it has been uh, rewarding and I, I have no regrets whatsoever because that has sort of built up my character to, of today. So it actually all depends on you, how you want to create your future, how you want to, you know, people say that I'm so adventurous. Well, in a way I am, but I always believe that because there's a Chinese saying uh, if you're born, you're born, everyone is born with a talent and that must be a reason for you to have that talent. I have always, in, in Mandarin, it's called a tian sheng wo, cai bi yu shuo yong. So that is, has been, always been in my mind, never, never to sort of, um, yeah, so, so that, that is a little bit of my life principle <laughs> and my background. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hun. So as you mentioned, you studied in Sweden and you've done your PhD as well. I would like yes. to ask you more about your education background. Before I went to Sweden, I attended a Chinese school all alone. And I, uh, of course, in, in Singapore, English, although it is called a uh, second language, but in actual fact, we, don't, we were not given a lot of opportunity to speak English. So it was a struggle. At that time, I had uh, two, uh, we call it dictionaries. One dictionary is from Swedish to English. Another one is English to Mandarin. So uh, imagine if you were to study a, a text in Swedish, even though I had attended Swedish uh, language course, but it doesn't, it did not qualify me to be able to speak, you know, uh, fluent English, uh, Swedish. Uh, and, and of course, let alone understand the text. So I had to, for every sentence I read, I had to go to, to through this two dictionaries. So I, I remember uh, when I sort of started at the university, we, uh, we will sort of some uh, schoolmates, we were standing together and one of the girls, her name is Lena. And she told me that, well, you know, yesterday I have studied 
uh, 50 pages. And then the, the next day she, she said, oh, I've studied 10, 100 pages. So, I mean, for me, it took me a whole day to study one page. So you, you can imagine how I felt. Uh, but somehow, I, I, I don't know, sometimes I think um, in a way I was kind of given some kind of uh, talent because even though I did not understand the language itself, but I understood the logic of the of the subject of the so-called uh, economic subject. So I understood the logic, and that had sort of saved me. Wow, that sounds like a very interesting story. <laughs> Having two dictionaries, crazy. You would have to go back and forth, back and forth. So Dr. Hoon, we want to talk a little bit about your PhD degree, as you mentioned a lot about the history on how you get your degree, which is very inspiring because that must have taken a lot of motivation for you to really push yourself out there. So for your specification in your degree, what, what did you actually um, learn through university that, and what, what really makes you want to study that course even more? Writing a PhD was never my, my plan, my life plan, or my educational plan. It was never. So after I've completed my so-called uh, Bachelor of Degrees in, econ in, in Business Administration, I was employed by uh, several Swedish uh, corporations. Like uh, the first one was Tetra Pak. From Tetra Pak, I went to a Swedish, the largest uh, Swedish commercial bank called SEB. Actually, in Swedish, it's called Skandinaviska and Banken. So, in short, in abbreviation, it's S E B. And after that, I joined uh, a company called Alpha Laval. Alpha Laval is a company that manufactures uh, machines for dairy products, not only milking machines, but also uh, machines that uh, kill bacteria, separates uh, the fat and the skim milk, and also pasteurized. So, I mean, this is the company. So during this time, I was um, responsible to receive delegations that came from China. Uh, that was in, in 1984, and we had like 40, 50 Chinese delegations from PRC. And I took care of each and, each and every one. At that time, uh, it was really high-level people that came. You know, the, the mayor of Beijing, the mayor of Shanghai, uh, but to me, I was just an employee of Alpha Laval, and I had a very good relationship with the Swedish, the, with the Chinese uh, commercial counselor at the PRC embassy in Stockholm. And he, he actually encouraged me, he said, you see, we have so much problem with joint ventures. Why don't you, uh, you know, just take a look at it. So he arranged me to come to Beijing and to meet Chu Rongji, Chu Rongji was at that time the uh, vice minister of state economic commission. That was a very high position. And Chu Rongji became the prime minister of China a few years later. He was really top, top, top guy. So with his support and blessings, uh, I was given uh, you know, a, a tour to Nigeria. Well, actually, I, uh, I financed my, my trip myself, but I... I so I went to nine joint ventures companies in Beijing, Shenyang, Dalian, and Shanghai to study, to make a pre uh, feasibility study of nine joint venture companies. Then I decided to go into uh, Shanghai Volkswagen and Beijing Jeep to make a sort of comparison and in-depth study. So it, it was just uh, out of curiosity. You know, I did not plan to do so much, but then, uh, they were so, um, when I visited all these companies, they were telling the, the foreign sites will tell me the problems with Chinese people and the Chinese um, partner will giving me a lot of accounts on, on how difficult it was to work with foreign people. Well, on the surface, it might sound like it was a cross-cultural you know, problem, but when I look into it, it was much more than that. It was about, well, cross-cultural clashes is one of them, but there were also organizational uh, culture because in China, they work with the so-called state economic plan. So the state tells you, well, uh, this year, you produce uh, X ton of steels. 
So they, they don't do it in accordance with the market requirement. But the people that come from foreign countries, they were working under the so-called market economy. So they were produced in accordance with the demands. So for them, it's a matter of supply and demand. But for the Chinese people, it was the whatever state tells you to do, you do it. And then you just submit the quota by the end of the year. And so, uh, and it was also a lot of mistrust and it was a lot of a leadership problem as well. So, uh, it, uh, I don't know if you sort of um, take, you know, show the picture, but actually, so initially I had not anticipated to do such an in-depth study, but then as more information came, for, came forth, I was sort of compelled to go further. So it took me, I mean, of course I did it on part-time because I was still employed by Alpha Laval and I was given birth to two wonderful children. And so uh, I was doing this on a part-time basis and it was sort of in-depth and long, longitudinal. So it's a long, from 86 until 90, 92 and 94, I published my PhD. So uh, this was a, this was a I, I don't know if I'm talking too sort of deep in this subject, but it was very interesting because actually what I have found out, it was not so much of, of course, all the systems, the practices uh, made, um, cr created, you know, disturbances or, or problems, but actually it was still a human factor underneath. So it's about goodwill. It, it's about, you know, um, a good intention. So Dr. Hun, you talk a little bit about um, your story and how your work experience has shaped you to getting a PhD degree. So today we want to discuss a little bit about, for example, the youngster nowadays, like you've mentioned before, you have two beautiful children. Um, how do you think as younger people today, we can actually find that specific um, suitable job for us, that suitable career path for us, in your opinion? How do we explore that side? Um, well, well, first of all, I don't, I don't think so much of career, you know. Uh, how should I say, like I said, when I did my doctorate thesis, oh, by the way, it was awarded the best doctorate thesis of the year in Sweden. I can tell you this title is difficult to come by. So I have, so, you know, it is, and, and uh, because in Sweden, this is a country where um, whatever, what is, you know, even though they, they don't have the racist uh, problem, but still they will prefer their own people. So being a woman is a woman researcher, a, a female researcher is one. Another one, it's also, uh, even though I've lived in Sweden for so many years, like 40 years, uh, they don't refer me as sweet, you know, the Swedish person, they call me Swedish Chinese. So, uh, and you are in this society to, well, uh, I, I don't say strive or, or fight for your positions, but you still need to have some kind of recognitions. And when I did this doctorate thesis, uh, I, I did not have big ambitions. So what, in other words, you don't have to need, you don't need to have a big ambition. What you have to do is whatever you are undertaking, do your best. And as I, I have always said to Aisha, that you never know what, life's, what life brings you. You never know. I never thought of, going to Sweden for one thing. Um, it, it, it'll be after my, my pre-university, I, I, because I was from a Chinese school, I knew that I would not have a good chance to work in so-called Singapore governmental um, agencies. So, and I love travel, although I had never traveled before. I, I, I wanted to see the world. So I applied a job as a, as stewardess at Singapore Airlines. <laughs> and uh, for that, I went to Novena Church every day to pray. 
for me to get a job. So I went to interview, but for some reason I was not accepted. And all of a sudden I was invited to study in Sweden. So, see, so in a way, the life has sort of planned for you. You just need to do your best. This is what I always say. <laughs> and without any hes hesitation, I just went. So, so cool. Sorry to cut you. Yeah. Um, that's really, really awesome. And uh, Dr. Hoon, I wanted to ask about, because you, I'm sure you've already been through a lot, like what you said in your story. And I'm sure that takes a lot of mentality to cope with it. So I want to ask, like, what actually become a source of motivation for you? Because I think uh, we we want to we have a, a a big generation gap, as as you as we mentioned before. And I want to know how you find the strength to be able to cope through it. Just because I think because of the different mindsets and the different education that we the three of us in this call indulge um, in the daily basis. I want to know, we want to know how you indulge in it and how you find the strength to really um, start from where you were before and then get to where you are right now. Um, first of all, I must also say that luckily I have a very humble attitude. I never, you know, uh, maybe be, it's because of my background. I never felt that I knew everything. I, I, I always have a humble attitude in learning and in listening to people, uh, their advice. And as I said, uh, I did not have big ambition, but uh, because I was humble, then I just followed my heart. I believe that somehow, you just need, need to do your best in life, whatever is giving, you know, whatever task is, is, is uh, being given to you. It, it, for me, it's life is like preparing you uh, without you knowing it. Because uh, I also think of um, sometimes when we pray for something, we thought, you know, like the Singapore Airlines story, I thought that would be my best uh, solution. But life has other things for you, which is better. So when I look back, I say, wow, luckily I did not get a job at Singapore Airlines. Otherwise, I would be ending up, you know, uh, and, you know, like, uh, I, I know that because uh, it should be quite tough to be, to work as a, as the widows, because you need to be, well, you, you have to have a very good uh, service attitude towards the passengers, right? Uh, I mean, I have good attitude, it's, it's not that, but life gives me better, something better than that. So, so uh, and, and, and really my, my life, my, my, ad, my whole attitude is, if I'm given a talent, that must be some reasons. And whatever I do, I do my best because it's like, uh, uh, um, it's building me up, you know, from one step to the another without you knowing it. So when the time comes, then it is like, wow, you, you will just uh, have this aha, you know, the, the experience. Yeah, it's like a momentum, right? Yeah. Yeah, so do you believe in that momentum? Do you actually go by that instinct? Yes, I do. So, so in other words, whatever I do, I know sometimes it's tough. Sometimes it's... Uh, you don't have the energy or it's tough or you don't have enough knowledge, but just stick with it, just work with it. And finally, you will see the solutions. You will see the, the connections. I, I think it's about resilience and it's about hard working. It's about um, persistency and believe in what you are doing. I mean, it's, sometimes it's so easy to say, believe in what you are doing because you may not know what what you do is right or wrong I get my point yeah Dr. Hunt you touch a little bit about resilience and strength so I think not a lot of people know what resilience really mean in a way but for you I believe that resilience and strength is developed because of hardship everything you, you are doing is building your strength here it's actually building you up to your achievement which um, 
for for being able to do building up to your achievement and leading up to this point because of all the hardships you went through right and so yeah. do you think that um for now nowadays in modern day society in where we have all these problems like the virus or just a little minor inconveniences how do you think we can uh, view that perspective of oh i want to build strengths and resilience through this particular situation even though maybe sometimes people find it hard because we have different strengths and level of mentality how do you think we can shape our perception towards it well i think uh, one most important thing is your your so called mindset a lot of people they, they are sort of uh, they are lost they have no self awareness uh they are being uh, spoon fed they do not they do not have to go through hardship um so resilience and strength do not come overnight you just have to go through a, a process to uh, to sort of you really need to in order to uh come to a stage then you say wow that was as i said aha experience you you don't get those overnight you have to face because life if you if you think about this feng shui if you think about all this even the you know um the 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 the, the so called uh, christianity is because all, all this mindset in all christians because in, in christianity it says that all, all people uh, have their sort of a cross to to carry so that is hardship right and you don't you need to go through all this to build your resilience if you are not prepared if if you don't have a humble attitude if you are not prepared to um if you are not prepared to to well, in a way work hard to to not to give up then you can never build up the resilience the strength Yes, that sounds uh pretty amazing. I really like how you talk about a little bit about humble attitude. Um so Aisha and I here we have been working on a little bit of a self-love journey which means we've actually been really practicing all the things you actually said in advance. So Dr. Hun, um how do you think for you cuz obviously it's been a long time since you were in your teenager years transitioning in your 20s. How do you mm. think um you learn how to really accept yourself for who you are starting in that journey in this journey that you're walking on how do you choose you every single day when you first begin your journey wow that was a tough that is a tough question how do i choose myself um i, I don't think i can choose to be myself it's just that as i said the mindset and the humble attitude this interview is useful or maybe it's not but what i'm saying is I'll try to embrace whatever you are given, you know, try to do your best in life. And um everybody is born with definitely talents. It's just how to explore your talent and with that you use a humble attitude to be open minded to show compassion people to to people because when you do that when you are going through hardship then you will feel oh this is how they feel and then you will understand other people better and that is how you build up your mindset that is how you build up your character your dignity that's very very interesting i really like how you mentioned before that it's a process i think that part is process part is a little bit hard to accept because nowadays we like to do things very quickly and very instantly so dr hun uh just to wrap up our podcast today i'm very interested in how you say that um we're able to make our own own decisions and our own choices so for you because you you already you have a phd degree i mean how far can you go then because it's already <laughs> like that's like the top of the food chain would you recommend people to actually get a phd degree and if they don't get a phd degree or they do decide to get a phd degree, your degree right now how does that affect your life and do you feel like oh i'm so much cooler because i have a phd or do you maybe feel like oh i'm so educated like all these people are not even close to me or have you ever felt like 
I, I feel like I want more people to take a PhD. How do you feel about it? Because I can tell that your life and your education and your Sweden journey has affected you as a person so much that I, I want to know if you would recommend that to other people. Well, first, first of all, I have to say, you know, making a PhD is not, it's a very, it's a very tough um, process. You have to read um, a lot of uh, scholars' work. You have to you have to put a lot of work, and you have to sacrifice a lot in it. So, as I said, when I uh, you know completed my bachelor degrees, I did not even have a, a life plan for my PhD. It just came. I was sort of pushed into it. Uh, I, I was given a, op, the opportunity to meet the top, top people from China, the Chu Rongji. I don't think many people have had sort of uh, met him. You know, he was a prime minister of China at one point of the time. And uh, so I never dreamt of that. I was pushed into it. But uh, as I said, because I always have this uh, idea, Tian Sen Wo Chai Bi Yu So Yong. That means if I'm given a talent, talent that must be a, 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 a usage for that so with this uh, uh, humble attitude with open-mindedness and the thing is i also have this habit whatever i do when i have a start i want to see it to the end and i want to do it to do it as excellently as possible it's not like um, I anyhow do it just to, you know, to, to wrap up the, the PhD. I did my best. I gave my life. Of course, I sacrificed a lot with my children, spending time with my children, which I have regrets today. But my children said, Mom, don't worry. You, you have raised us well. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Anyway, I just, I just, so it's a lot of sacrifice whether or not, uh, so, so whether or not to write a PhD, it, it's really uh, your interest. If you're curious about life, about uh, if, you're in, if you are an uh, inquisitive person, go for it. But bear in mind that you have to know a lot of things. You have to read a lot of uh, other scholars' uh, works before you can contribute something new in the scientific world. And, and writing a PhD is about contributing in addition to what has already been done. Uh, but, but again, some people find, uh, and the subjects can vary. Uh, some people can write a PhD in a subject that is um, maybe easily to, 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 to sort of uh, work on. I did a stupid thing because I, ex I, was, I, was, do I was doing, well, no, not too stupid, but I was too curious. So I sort of uh, did an ex exploratory type of study. And that has sort of uh, served the foundation for today's joint ventures theories. So in other words, when you have got a PhD, it actually shows that you have uh, authority in that area. So anybody that going to China to form a joint venture or elsewhere to form a joint venture, if they come to ask me anything, any questions, I can answer you. I, we call it, the, we have the authority in that subject, in joint, international joint venture. And, and bef before you build up this authority, you need to go through hard work, <laughs> a process again. That's a very interesting um, point of view. And I'm sure that it's not easy and you're sleepless night, but it's all worth <laughs> it at the end, as I can tell. Yeah. You're sharing so much knowledge that I'm very like, at the same, I'm like stunned, but at the same time, I'm like, I'm trying to indulge in your knowledge. So Dr. Hun, um, before we close the podcast today, actually, I want to ask Aish, because uh, Aish happens to be in your class. And yes. Well, Aish, do you have do you think you have any particular questions for Dr. Hun that you want to ask that you probably would never bring it up in class? So do you think you have any questions in regards to the topic or just something interesting that could help uh, with the self-love journey and all of this? Uh, I would actually just like to ask, whenever you feel a little demotivated, like, you know, sometimes they're overloaded with assignments and everything, how do you cope up with everything like how do you bring yourself up again uh well the most important thing is good nutritious food sleep and exercise that is the basic before you get the uh, sort of a uh, physical part to 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 do your study and as a matter of fact 
fact, now I have sort of learned the technique not to think of the others too much. I just do one thing at a time. Otherwise, you will be so overwhelmed. When, you, when you're doing one thing at a time, you have to prioritize. You have to plan. And when you are doing one thing at a time, you do it full heartedly with full concentration. And this is what I'm, of, of course, sometimes, well, uh, you know, when, when I'm doing my, my tutorial sessions and I'm give, given a certain standard sets of slides, for instance, but then I would think, how do I make the students more interest, you know, uh, interested in this subject? How do I uh, evoke their, their curiosity? It's not easy because, you know, uh, students can uh, vary, for, for Chinese students, sometimes they are struggling with their English or they are here for certain reasons. But for me, I still try to do that. And so I will not come up with the solution immediately, but uh, then I will sort of uh, do some exercise, uh, go for a walk, then I come back, then I get new ideas. Oh, this is what I can do. So, so this is, um, yeah, so I'm saying that just focus on one thing at a time. Don't think so much of the other things. A am I making sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I, I do agree with you. Yeah, so I think that is, that is the best way because otherwise you will just get overwhelmed. And you do one thing at a time with, you know, um, the best you can. I wouldn't say perfections, but the best you can. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Hoan, for sharing a little bit of your story and your life and just your journey. I think because <laughs> I've, I've never really had you and listening to all this, I'm just so stunned because the, I, I didn't know that you went through all this, obviously. And it, I'm sure that our listeners would also be motivated to live life and just start searching for themselves after listening to your story. So thank you so much for being here today. And for oh, um, uh, by the way, sure. I have to yeah. say that today, today I can, you uh, know, uh, I can say that I speak three languages fluently. Wow! Time, you know, nice. I can speak and read, and and even uh, that is Swedish, of course, because I've you know spent forty years in Sweden, so Swedish is, has become my first language. And then, of course, English and Mandarin. That's so cool. And so on cool. top of that, I've learned some German and, uh, and uh, Danish and Norwegian. They are so close to Swedish language. So you, you, get, you get them. It, it came along. They, they come along with the Swedish language. So, I mean, in other words, if you have not gone through all this hardship, you will never appreciate. You will never, you never get this kind of uh, proficiencies. That is true. I actually agree with you. I'm sure that even though it's hard, it's all worth it at the end. So thank you so much for sharing and for being here and being humble and being able to just share a piece of your life. Well, actually, I think it's most parts of your life that you share with us today. And uh, yeah, thank you so much.